Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Today, our guest is Steve Novotny. Steve has a many decades of experience in the entrepreneurial community and running his own businesses, and he is going to walk us through several of his journeys. We spend the most time talking about his golf website and brand. This is something that he started almost two decades ago now and grew to the point where it was bought by a major corporation here in the United States a while back. Now, this is a very large golf site that he reveals uh, the details behind. And he does not take the traditional approach to website building and to brand building that a lot of us took uh, and take with our websites to this day. As a matter of fact, while he does do and did do all the SEO stuff that we talk about, a lot of the marketing stuff we talked about, he really got his hands dirty. He rolled up his sleeves. He is very clear about all the different unique strategies that he took to grow the website and the brand to what it is today. This is a a large website, a major player in the golf industry. And I think my favorite part about this interview is listening to Steve talk about all the different approaches that he takes to larger business, how he looks to solve problems when he's looking for solutions to build, how he goes about partnering with people, how he finds experts, uh, how he finds solutions, and how he has consistently found solutions in different softwares that he's partnered up with. Steve's original venture that we spent a little time on was actually creating a little bit of a, of a marketplace or a shopping portal for Amazon back when it was just a bookstore. He went on to build this golf brand and now, after selling, spends his time as a developer for new homes, new apartments, and that sort of thing. This is just a very inspirational interview. It's not going to take the typical tact of site building. It's going to take a much higher level approach, and it's going to it's going to give you a lot of different things to think about, certainly some of them out of the box, to inspire you with your entrepreneurial journey, with your website building, with your brand building. Hope you enjoy all the different things that Steve has to share today. Have you been frustrated with your Google traffic lately? Are you tired of tools that make you search through millions of keywords and require a math degree to figure out? There's an SEO tool called Rank IQ that can help. They're ranked number one on G2 for both ease of use and customer satisfaction. Rank IQ gives you a list of the lowest competition, high traffic keywords in your niche, and they are all clear winners. When you choose one of their hand-picked keywords, their AI takes over and gives you a simple report telling you what Google wants you to cover in your blog post. Whether you have a new site or have been around for a while, Rank IQ will take your Google traffic to a whole new level. Go to rankiq.com slash niche pursuits to lock yourself in at 50% off their monthly rate. I'll put this special link in the episode's description. Hey, Jared here. Today's episode is sponsored by onelittleweb.com, a bespoke link building service provider trusted by hundreds of niche site business owners just like you. One Little Web manually handpicks real and relevant sites for guest post backlinks that receive at least 5,000 monthly organic visitors from Google. The best part is that you can check the quality of the sites and approve or ask for replacements until you get the desired domains for your guest posts. So we've arranged an exclusive welcome offer for Niche Pursuits listeners, where you will get a free DA40 backlink on your first order of a DA50 backlink. So again, you'll love One Little Web because A, they guarantee guest post backlinks with 5,000 plus monthly organic traffic sites. B, they let you review the sites beforehand and approve them. C, they write a 1,000 word, well-researched content post for every single guest post. So go to onelittleweb.com slash niche pursuits to claim your free DA40 backlink today. Again, that's O-N-E, L-I-T-T-L-E-W-E-B dot com slash niche pursuits. Welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman, and today we're joined by Steve Novotny. Steve, welcome on board. Hey, thanks for having me. I sure appreciate it. 
Yeah, yeah. Today's going to be a lot of fun. You certainly brought the bright to the podcast. I love it. For those of you uh, listening, you can't see that. Uh, uh, not only do you have a, a very bright yellow shirt, it, does it match? What is that in the back? Or is that a, is that a, a bowling a kingpin or something? Oh, yeah. So uh, is there a bowling kingpin right there? I think there oh, is. Yeah, you, show this to you. Are you a bowling guy? <laughs> so so uh, one of our projects, we demolished a bowling alley. <laughs> it was really sad, Jared. Uh, it had been there for... I want to say 65 years. And the owner came to us. He says, Steve, you know what? It costs us more every year to run this comp- this bowling alley, but people aren't willing to pay what it takes to run it. So I'm selling it. And the whole neighborhood had a conniption fit and they thought we were really bad guys. And, uh, but now it's a beautiful 134 unit apartment complex. Well, that leads nicely into what we'll be talking about today. You, you, you have your hands in real estate today, but you've got quite a, a storied uh, past. And I mean, I think people are going to be really excited to hear some of the other ventures you've been a part of prior to real estate. Why don't you catch us up on a bit of the journey and a bit of your background? And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of the meat and potatoes for today's interview. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Well, I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. When I was eight years old, I started my first company. And that was a yo-yo repair service. And I had quite a few employees. Uh, The problem was the whole neighborhood were my employees. So I didn't have many uh, clients. (laughs) Uh, But man, could we polish a great yo-yo? So anyway, long story short is I've always been entrepreneurial looking to, to solve problems for revenue, which is really what entrepreneur does. But then I got married and my wife and I, we went and we did a, uh, pastoring together. I, I was a youth pastor for a lot of years, and then I worked in the big churches. And then uh, through that process, I realized that the business edge of my brain was always going. And so uh, I, my boss at that time was a super cool guy. We were pastoring a very large church, and he was, he was my uh, head pastor, if you will. And I said, can I make you a deal? I said, how about I give you my paycheck back, but I still pastor. I said, I love pastoring, but I need to have time to go start some ventures if it's in my head. And so I'll give you my paycheck back. I'll be here every Sunday, but if I got to go down on a business trip, you'll let me do that. And he says, I don't have to pay you. And I said, yeah, you have to pay me. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So anyway, uh, that's how I started uh, Steve Navani Enterprises. That was in 1997, if you will. I'm aging myself a little bit. I'm um, currently today 61. But then uh, from that, it took off, and I did various ventures and entrepreneurial ideas. Uh, I helped uh, develop uh, one of the first white label Amazon book sites that uh, was real unique at its time. Now Amazon's way more in the books, but people sometimes forget Amazon started just by selling books. That's right. That's right. It did. Yeah. And so we created a white label site where nonprofits could have an Amazon type bookstore on their website, uh, but it would be labeled as if it was their bookstore. And we just did some behind the scenes uh, connecting for uh, distributors in the area and they got to be their own bookstore and sell books all across the nation. So anyway, I just kept developing things like that and uh, eventually uh, started a a real successful, uh, what I call internet SaaS company, which is what a lot of people in niche pursuits do, which means software as a service. You either sell a product or you sell a service. If you sell a service, you don't have to worry about delivery of a product. And that's why I loved it so much. And so we started a software as a service product for the golf community. And uh, that was a great time, enjoyed it, learned how to do things. And then in that process, when I sold that company, I went off into product and property development, which I had a niche for that because somebody a few years back taught me how to build a house. And I thought, well, if I can build a house, I can build a duplex. And if I can build a duplex, I can build a triplex. And then why not do a fourplex? And then, well, heck, let's just figure out we can do an apartment complex. And so that's kind of what I do today. (laughs) Well, you you gloss over that in three or four minutes as though though it's a quick hit. Each of those on their own are pretty fascinating and interesting. 
I'm so curious to go back to where you first got the concepts along the Amazon business that you made back yeah. in the early, I mean, cause you're right back in the early days, I mean, Amazon was just a bookstore, hadn't pivoted yeah. into the, the behemoth it was. And you had been coming off of pastoring, which I'm, I'm guessing there wasn't a whole lot of, um, you know, business development and uh, uh, biz dev, as we say, like, how did you get the idea for this? And then how did you go about executing that first project? Uh, you know, I'm just curious how you put it all together. Yeah. Well, you got to remember a lot of times you don't necessarily need to invent the business, but you just need to know how to promote the business. You know, uh, there's that great book, Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And he talks about the three people that you need to make things work. There is a market maven, which means that they know their product and material or service. There is the connector, which you go to them if you want to find somebody else. And then there's the salesman. And you need one of those three to be successful in some aspect. Well, the connector and the salesman is kind of my heartbeat. That's where I've always been. It really doesn't matter what it is. If I like the product and believe in it, I can sell it. Mm -hmm. So in the nonprofit community and in the church community, they're always looking for mechanisms to raise additional revenue. It's just, you know, they live by donations. And so we got to know, or I should say me personally, got to know a gentleman who had created a software that interfaced with book distributors across the United States. And that interface allowed us to make a website to connect to their dis distribution system, essentially creating an Amazon, yeah. but for the nonprofit world. And we could specify what niche of books magazines and distribution materials that they wanted on their website they could hand select that and so we would go to these nonprofits and say hey do our white label we make five percent on everything and so that's how we got into that it just it was one of the things where serendipitous i met a guy that knew a thing that needed people to go out and get the word out and i said well i know how to get the word out and that's how it started <laughs> the golf site that you mentioned. And I think that this is maybe something to camp on for a little while. Obviously, the audience here is, broadly speaking, very, very invested in building websites. Um, yes. Talk about the genesis of your golf site. Yeah. Well, we invented a company that's known today as golfnow.com. When we first started it, we called it by area codes. So in my area, Seattle was called golf206.com. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, it was, you know, that way it kind of locally niched it, if you will. The problem was it was at the time when everything was exploding in the internet, right? And it was right at that point where even phone systems were starting to go to internet protocol. So all of a sudden they realized that they got so many people coming online, particularly with cell phones, that they needed to up the area codes. That's right. So from 206, my area that I service all became 206, 425, 253, and 360. That's right. Yeah, 360, I recognize. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, I had to have in the region that I was running was Washington and Idaho area. I had to come up with new website domain names and all this stuff. And then we just realized as a large company that that's not going to fly. So we went on a word search and we figured we bought actually back in the day, golfnow.com. I think it cost us $9,000 wow. and that's what it's known today. Where did you get, I mean, are you an avid golfer? How did you end up lining yeah, up the golf? It's a funny story because I'll tell you what happened is, is that I love the golf and I had three kids and every weekend it was soccer, baseball, I mean, you name it. And I recognized that my golf game was going downhill real fast. So I thought, dang, how do I figure out how to be able to play on the weekday versus the weekend? And so I met a friend who knew a friend that had this software. And I was working with the original guy, uh, his friend. I was working with him on another development. And he says, you know, you should talk to my son. He's starting this new golf company. And he needs people. He's just pulling it out of beta. And I think you really get in the woods in it. But long story short is that this is during the dot-com bomb. If you remember, most of your people remember, but in 2000, 
we everything was going dot com. If you remember, there was pets.com, there was this.com, and there was all this silly investment money being rolled into these dot coms. I'll never forget that Super Bowl that year. All these dot coms were there. And I think 75% of the advertisement on that Super Bowl 2000, those companies weren't existed in 2001, wow. just like overnight, right? Well, this group of two guys developed this inter-office software where here was their idea. They thought if we gave every golf course a computer with a private network, and they could interface back and forth. They could trade tee times with each other because you got to remember in the golf industry, what you're wanting to look for is a tee time, right? Yep. I mean, yep. it's very common now. Uh, just like you book an airline ticket online, they said, well, let's just do a, uh, let's do a tee time online. So their idea was this network, this computer. Uh, it was all where there was an intranet and an internet. It was right at the birth of the internet. And so you could have a private network versus a public network. Well, that eventually went away. Now we just have a public network with firewalls, okay? Uh, so I just, uh, they, they went bankrupt, basically. They were in the dot-com. They lost about $20 million. But out of the bankruptcy, they came out with owning the software. And the software was the secret to the sauce. They didn't have any money but they had the software and they figured out the mousetrap. And the mousetrap was forget the computer systems, forget all that, just get a website out going and figure out a way to connect the golfer that's online to the golf course that's in his neighborhood and marry the two on the internet and let them do business together. And that worked. So and you were, and, and to coin the phrase that you've already used a couple of times, you were the connector there. You brought I the audience. The, to I was the connector, software. Yeah. Yeah. And I was the salesperson because honestly, Jared, it was a hardcore sale. I had to go because I had two customers. I had the golfer, but I also had the golf course owner. So I had to convince the golfer that I had the golf courses he wanted to play at. But then I had to convince the golf course owner that I had the players that wanted to play there. And this was the beginning. And you got to remember, um, people were leery of the internet in the beginning, right? So golf course owners thought, everyone wants to play my golf course. All I have to do is stand here behind this counter, have some Snickers bars and some Diet Cokes. They're going to buy that. They're going to go play my course. And maybe after they go eat at my cafe. Well, what happened is people stopped playing golf as much. They couldn't believe it. And here's why it happened. They called it the Tiger Effect back then. This is when Tiger Woods first came on the scene. Mm -hmm. And when he did that, they thought there would be this huge young community of golfers that would go out and play. So they doubled the amount of golf courses in the United States within 10 years. Wow. But they found something about American people. They didn't take up golfing the way they thought they would. For a couple of reasons. Number one, golf is very difficult. So you don't learn very well. And number two, golf takes at least, at least four to six hours to play. And most Americans are super busy. So when that happened, it created this huge amount of supply. So golf courses were now interested in talking to me with the new technology about how I had all these golfers that want to play their golf course if they allow me to send them there and I wouldn't charge them a cent. Wow. Yeah. So how did you go about building this brand that got traffic? You know, I mean, obviously the software, especially for the time, is amazing. It's revolutionary. It's solving a huge problem. But I mean, conceptually, it makes sense. But how did you get the site, the website, or as you transitioned from many sites into just the golfnow.com property, how did you get so many golfers to come uh, to your website? Well, here's where the selling comes in, right? Because I told you, you need a salesperson and a connector. So it was my job to connect the golf courses to my golfers, and I had to get my golfers. And what we found is what was needed is that to make this work, we literally had to send salespeople out into the masses. 
we had to go to every area and we had to hire people to be the regional sales manager. So I was like the regional guy in all of Washington state in Idaho and little parts of Canada. And it was my job to control this area. And I actually bought what they called a license. So it's not a franchise, it's a license. And the difference is, is that a license gives you the right or permission to, to make revenue on a product. And you have to give the owner of the, of the license, I'm the licensee, you have to give the owner of the license or a revenue share. He doesn't have to pay for marketing. He doesn't have to do this or that. If he does something, he has to let you do that. But he, it's up to you to make it run. Where a franchise is totally different. Mm-hmm. You, they're more controlled. They more give you a perfect mousetrap. They hadn't figured the mousetrap up yet. So I had to pay back in the day. And this was a lot of money back then, especially for me. I, I had to write a check for you know almost $40,000 to have the right to sell a product that wasn't even proven. Right. But Jared, man, I saw that I saw that this thing would work because I was a golfer and I was internet savvy. Uh, and that was the other thing, you know, you, I realized there's these, there's these people like me at the times I was in my early thirties that were embracing the internet. And I know this place, this thing was going to boom and explode by the, when we first started our golf company, we literally hand the golf course pro a pager. Mm-hmm. Remember those back in the day, every doctor had a pager and then pagers, everyone, their mother had a pager and then it was a blue Blackberry and yada, yada, yada. And they would get a beat and then it would be Joe Schmo, 220 PM, play golf. By the time we sold the company, mm-hmm. everything was completely interfaced and they had electronic T sheet systems and they would just stand there and then we just start filling up and propagating their times. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I got to see that whole process take place. And so my job, did, that's, this is a long answer. Sorry about this. So I had a dilemma. How am I going to get people to use my site and believe me that I got all these golf courses? And the golf courses want to know how many people I had. So here's how I did it. This is hardcore selling 101. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I had to work my butt off. Every year, and probably in your area too, there's what they call a golf show where it's about the beginning of the season, January, February, and you go to the, to the exposition center and you see all the latest clubs, all the golf courses show up. It's just like a big golf fest. And if you're into golfing, there's a good chance you're going to be there. And that's where my client was. So I rented a booth, just the standard booth that cost me like 1500 bucks a month. But on the side I went to the owner of the golf show and, and I said, I got a deal for you. I said, if you will give me the database of every person that went to that show, I'll write you a big fat check and you just keep it between you and me. Cause he didn't do that. He didn't sell his database cause that was his bread and butter. Mm-hmm. And I said, I will also promote you and everything I do and you'll help me build my database. And so I did that and I received probably about 25,000 names on that first golf show. And out of those 25,000 names, probably three to 4,000 became users. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got it started. But here's the other thing that's interesting, Jared. When I would go to golf courses, they would say, well, Steve, this looks good, but how many golfers do you really have? And I didn't have any golfers. So here's what I said. This is what a salesman says. We are going to have thousands. But how many do you have? Well, it's growing right now. And I can promise you there'll be hundreds of golfers that love to play your golf course. I never completely answered the question because if I did, I'd say, well, I don't have any. And then that puts me on the same playing field as him. Like, well, he doesn't have any and I don't have any. Then what does he bring to the table? So that was a little bit of the selling mechanism right there. It was the chicken or the egg kind of thing, right? So after three golf shows, I had the biggest database of golfers in Washington and Idaho, and golf courses started now coming to me. And uh, But 
it was hardcore selling. And that's the thing in life. Some things you're just going to have to go out and you're going to have to pitch yourself. You're going to have to tell people, how, how are they going to make a buck in this? You know, why should I buy your product and not anybody else's? And that's a great thing with good websites is that they compel you, right? They compel you to do something. They compel you to buy that course or they compel you to buy this service or that product. So I was the compeller and I had to tell these guys how to do it. It was about a five-year process. And within five years, we were rocking and rolling. But this is an interesting tidbit of information. Within 12 months, I paid off that $40,000 mm -hmm. and I was profitable. Just because it, the, 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 the product worked. Where was the monetization? of the of the of the site for you you talked about how you didn't make any money i think you said you didn't make any money necessarily for referring someone to the golf course so where did the didn't charge a cent you did, okay good you're you're selling me already as i can tell so so where was the monetization underneath the um it, underneath the infrastructure of all this so jared at the end of the day what is the one commodity that a golf course has that expires the one commodity that golf course has, it expires time. You can't use the next day. It's the tea time. The timing of when people can, can actually sign up. Every 10 minutes, right? If you don't fill up that 10 minutes, it expires. It's like a, it's like a piece of fruit on a fruit stand, right? There's, it's good until it's not. And then it's not. And if it's not, it's not. So I said, I'll make a deal with you. And I would look at their tea sheet. I say, do you know that you have 50% of your tea times every year expire worthless? I said, do this. Give me your bad tea time. And usually the bad tea time was an hour before twilight. I was about to say, is this where twilight rates got uh, created? Are you, the, are you the one who created twilight rates? Dude, I'm the one that created the horse race in the golf industry. I'll just tell you straight out. So we said, listen, your hardest tea time to sell is an hour before twilight because who wants to pay full rack rate if at 2.30 you could pay half price? So I said, if you try and do that in your, in your pro shop, everyone's going to get all pissed at you. I said, how about you have online exclusive deals and I'll sell all those at different prices, just like an airline. I try to tell them, look at your golf course like an airline. If you had everyone raise their hand and say, how many paid this rate on the airline? It'd only be usually one to two hands. Everyone's paying all different rates. Mm -hmm. They're yield managing their amount of available seats. Why, Tom said, yield manage your golf course. It won't lose your value. They're always worried about value. Well, da, da, da. I said, well, that's why we only do it under certain time constraints. But for me, Give me your tea time an hour before, and I'll make the revenue on that one portion. And so every day, I had 3.2 players that I made revenue on, and I could charge whatever price I wanted. And let me tell you, brother, that tea time always sold because I priced it right. So that was our red hot sale today. I forgot what we called it. We called it like the fire tea time or something like that. My, uh, my first job, I was a wedding photographer and uh, first business I started. And, you know, it reminds me a lot of that because there's about 25 prime days a year to get married. Those, there, those are summer Saturdays, right? And oh, yeah. so you're always getting booked out for those 25 Saturdays. That's a given. But what about the other 325 days of the year? When no one wants to get married on a Tuesday or on a Sunday in December, could have used your help in, uh, in that industry as well. But <laughs> you clearly have this approach. And I, I, I want to highlight it at this point in the interview because, you know, I don't want to overcharacterize people, but certainly I think website owners nowadays tend to rely on more traditional methods of growing their site. Perhaps, uh, obviously, we talk a lot about SEO on here, about putting content on their site, about building links, networking. Uh, that sort of thing. You clearly have this approach you take, whether it's to your online businesses or even other ventures you've, you've mentioned where you really go out and you, you're really creative about the opportunities that you think of and about the ways you connect. I mean, you keep saying that word, but the ways you connect uh, solutions to problems. Can you talk about this from a high level, maybe especially speaking to people who have websites but aren't in the business of doing that right now with their website and might be missing some of these opportunities? 
Yeah, because as you mentioned, SEO, linking, social media, I did all of that. I totally glossed over all of that. Here's what I did, okay? And so this is where you've got to, you've got to decide your market and what your market needs, all right? Not what they want, but what they need. And my market needed somebody to guide them to some of the best deals in town for golf. This is golf industry specific, right? And so I became the golf guy in my area. So I had this great tool in our software where we had interfaced, interfaced a direct email system. So not only did they go to my website, but every night I would send them fresh tea time that would integrate where they could just click a tee time and boom, it go right into the system and they could buy it. And it was so much fun, Jared. I wake up in the morning and I sold $3,000 in tee time. I was just like, I just love sunny days. And this is Washington state, right? This isn't like Arizona, Arizona, their worst time is in the summertime, right? My worst time is rainy days and happens to be Seattle. So what happened is that newsletter is that I connected with them on a personal level. I was the golf guy. They knew me. Oh, you're Steve. Golfnow.com, right? Yeah, that's me. Oh, yeah, I read your newsletter. And I would, and here's what I did. Everyone loves to talk, right? Why does People Magazine sell? People Magazine sells because people want to get the inside gossip scoop about how somebody's underwear got exposed. And now they can see, see all these things that happen or there's, there's different people in Hollywood role and they're just as human as we are, right? So I was the golf guy that was telling people about the golf course. I would interview the manager. I would tell them the special deal they have going. And I just became the guy. And so every email, instead of just doing this totally, you know, basic website with tea times, which is what they want, I would always have a little storyline like a blog. So they always knew what was going on. And then I'd use that for the golf courses because then I'd start selling more tee times, right? They got all these tee times. And I said, hey, for an additional tee time, I can promote your golf course this week. And so then I would get one, two, and three tee times. So you got to remember that's important because a tee time is four players times $50, right? So I'm making... 3.2 was my average. So I'm making $175 every time somebody books my tee time seven days a week. If you think about this, if I've got 100 golf courses, which I think we were like at 80 or something for my region, times average of five tee times a week during peak season, right? Times 80. I mean, we were making some dough, baby. It was rock and roll. It was awesome. How did you expand it? I mean, it's national from, and I'm guessing like, you know, you keep talking about Steve, the Washington and Idaho guy. Did you expand it outside of that? And how did you make these connections with golf courses nationwide? Yeah. So here's how that worked is because you got to remember, I said I was a licensee. My friend owned the software. And so he owned some prime markets. He owned uh, Phoenix. He owned Portland, Scottsdale. And then there were other states that they sold licenses to. And here's what happened, Jared. There's no way I could expand at my level other states. Um, it just was no, I didn't have the capacity. Right. I wasn't mm -hmm. a full service sales team. I, I, I didn't have that, that capacity, but I knew I could handle this area. So I got it at beta. My friend developed it. I developed it with him and I own basically Washington, Idaho. So the whole nation took off because there was about 20 other guys like me. And we were all sharp sales guys. We all loved golf. We knew how to talk golf. That's another thing. You got to know how to talk the lingo, right? Whatever pursuit you're in, you need to be able to talk the lingo. And we were able to push that and do that. And so that's how it went nationwide and eventually uh, international. Wow. Well, golfnow.com today is huge. I, I was looking at some of the stats before. It's at thir over 32,000 pages on it. Domain rating of 83, according to Ahrefs. You know, you haven't you haven't owned it for a while. You you, you did sell it off. What what was the what was the prompt and the process like to sell it off and to move on? 
Yeah, it was a tough one. I'll tell you, I, I had some internal dialogue in my head and I had raised it to a point where I pretty much have peaked my market out. You can always make more. You can always do more. We started creating websites for golf courses uh, and they were completely interfaced. That gave me an extra tea time a day. Uh, we started bringing in tea sheet systems. We ended up buying a tea sheet system company, probably the best in the nation. There was about 30 different tea sheet systems and we interfaced with all of them. And that's why nobody could duplicate what we did. Jared, mm -hmm. our secret sauces was really what we call middleware. Our software was middleware. Not only did it have a website that connected golfers, but we could we created language for every platform out there on the mainstream. So we could, they'd say, oh yeah, well, we got this system. We say, great, not a problem. We got an API for that. We can connect right to that. So, uh, so we did that. So I really had to focus on my region and what, I, what we did. But there was an internal voice in me that said, Steve, do you want to go down to infamy as just the golf guy? Because for me, I love golf, but you got to remember, I started it because I wanted to play on the weekdays and not the weekend. <laughs> I was right? going to ask you at some point how that worked out for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the funny thing was, Don got it. My golf, my golf company only made money when I was behind a computer. Yep. I mean, you know, I, I would definitely have to go out and see the golf courses. That was a given. And I try to get a few holes in, but the majority of my time, I needed to be on the phone and then I needed to be just running the computer. Well, I don't know. I don't know if you know this, but you could have worked a good solid day there. I heard from someone there's a good deal at Twilight you could have picked up on. So yes, I could have done a very good deal. You're right. Uh, <laughs> here's the other thing I thought thought interesting, and this is again knowing your market. I found that my golf course guys started resenting me unless I went and talked to them. <laughs> so I had to do a soft touch at least every two weeks, which is a phone call, and I had to do a hard touch, which is I mean I went and visited them typically every six weeks. So this is a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, a full-time it job. Yeah, this was not a, um, you know, punch a couple buttons, strike up a deal, and you're off to the races and can sit back and sit my ties. This was, this was a lot of active work on an ongoing basis. I didn't know what I was getting into, to be honest with you. I'll tell you what happened the timing was so good. And then I'll tell you how we spun it off, is I was learning how to do housing and building development. Again, I have no building acumen in my body uh, other than I had a dad that was a DIY dad. So I could fix a, a, a leaky sink. I could fix a toilet. I could change my brakes. That's just kind of the way my dad was. I appreciate him doing that. I was the apprentice. I hated every minute of it, but I learned a lot. And so what it taught me is that I could learn to do things. That's all it taught me. It taught me that a skill set can be learned. And these were mechanical skill sets. So at the time when things were growing, but I was also doing other pursuits and that was housing building, the whole country crashed in the housing market. 2008, yeah. everything crashed, everything stopped, everything, houses were going for half price. So all of a sudden my ambitions of being a builder developer just died overnight. But I had in my hip pocket, golfnow.com. And I thought, you know what? Now's a great time to go in full time. Let's take this thing and let's rocket it to the moon. And so it was perfect timing. And I leave it, I leave it to God to give him thanks that I knew what to do, when to do it. It just happened. So it was full time. And uh, it was, but the timing was perfect. And so I did that. And so that, that, that's, I mean, I remember 08, obviously a, a, a seminal moment, certainly not only just in real estate, but in the entire global economy. And so you, you use it as a great chance to go all in. It's, it, it reminds me a bit, I mean, we're interviewing so many people this year in 2022 that have made big, big, big accomplishments on the back of the hardships that got, that started with COVID in 2020. And we're starting to hear these success stories that, almost reminds me of another kind of global situation back in 2008 and how you used it as an opportunity to go all in on something. And clearly it turned into a huge success. You got to remember one man's problem is another man's business, right? I mean, that's all we're doing. All the entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur does is solve problems, right? If you can solve a problem for a thousand people, 
you're going to make a thousand dollars. If you can solve a problem for a million people, you're going to make over a million dollars. You think about it. What is what? What did Bill Gates do with with software? He solved a problem for billions of people. He's a billionaire. So you're just learning to solve problems. And I realized that I was solving a big problem in the golf industry. Just like when I do building, I'm solving problems to help people have good shelter. Um, so that's what you learn to do. That's what everyone on this website and, and, and on your podcast and on Niche Pursuits, they're just learning how to help solve people's problems. And that's why it's a good thing. That's really what work is, right? Work is something that you should never despise. The work is lovely. What makes work difficult is the struggle. Mm-hmm. But you got to remember that struggle and growth are the same word. We like to say, oh, I really want to grow in this. But what you're saying is I really want to struggle. But if you don't struggle, you don't grow. And so uh, you just have to learn to embrace it. So I had to embrace, embrace the suck and how, how much work it took, if you will. So why did you end up selling the site? Why did you end up? I mean, I know you've talked about your passion for developing and for building, uh, and that's where you ended up. But what caused you to make that transition? We got stupid offers. Okay, well, it's a good we reason. Yeah, we, uh, we got a call um, from ESPN and they wanted, they liked our, our mousetrap. They, they, they thought that's cool. Mm. And they were about ready to give us an offer. And so we were talking about, well, how do we evaluate this? You know, we're trying to figure out what's the value of our customers. Because all I really had was, you know, they're going to eventually develop their own software, right? They'll use parts of ours, but what they're really saying, we want your database, right? That's what it comes down to. They wanted my golfers and they wanted my brand. So when that happened, the big boy on the block decided they better give us a call first. And that was Comcast. So Comcast called us up and most people don't know this, but Comcast owns many networks. They own Universal Studios, they own all these different media labels, one of them, which is the Golf Channel. Ah. They own Golf Channel. And uh, Comcast and the guys at Golf Channel says, we love your program, we love your product. What would you be willing to sell it for? But here is the hard part with them, because what happened, this is really fun, I'll tell you this, and then we can move on to any other stuff you want to do. So, here I am, things are rocking and rolling in this golfnow.com. We're doing great. Our owners of our licensors, which were basically, let's just call them the owners of the main beast, right? They own the most territories. Although they didn't own all of it, they just owned some cherry spots. They said, uh, we're talking to Golf Channel. We're thinking about selling to them. Here's what they had to say. They may be calling you because they couldn't sell our territory because I had the license for my area. It was like a hardcore contract that could never be changed. Uh, and I was grandfathered in to anything that happened to the mothership happened to me. So they eventually sold the golf channel, which I was super excited for them. It was great to do all of a sudden overnight on the golf channel there is 10 million dollars a year in paid advertising for golfnow.com and i didn't have to pay a dime overnight i'm on the golf channel so not only am i the golf guy but now i'm the golf channel guy that sells tea times and uh that lasted for about a year and then the phone started ringing yeah, Steve, hey, this is Joe Schmo. Great, great salespeople, by the way. Masters Train, Business, Dartmouth, uh, Harvard. Comcast buys the best. I'm just telling you straight up, that was a great experience. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, man, we love your product. We own this, that. Yeah, they've told us all about you guys. You're doing a great job out there. We're interested in buying your thing. What would you be willing to do? Well, listen, uh, you should come to you. You should come to Orlando. Visit us at our corporate center. Let's sit down. Let's talk. So they they flew me, and I had a buddy of mine who I had convinced. And 
you wouldn't believe how much I had to convince him. Finally, I finally told him, said, listen, you would be stupid if you don't pull out at least 30 grand and buy the state of Tennessee. That's where he lived, Tennessee. And I think he took part in Georgia, I forget. I said, just buy it. And he was a golfer and he was a sales guy. So I knew he could do it. Just buy it. Thank me later. Anyway, he, he did that. So we both went out there, saw all the studios, saw the different areas where they, you know, and the funny thing is the golf channel studios weren't very big. Every little scene that you see in the cameras is just a corner of a warehouse <laughs> surrounded by offices in the middle. And all the golf little hottie girls there talking about how to fix your swing and out there all bumping around. You're meeting everybody and all that. So we had a talk. They talked about how they want to sell us. So then here's what happens. We all go home. I get the call from the big kahuna from one Philadelphia place, which is the headquarters of Comcast. It's the 60 story high rise. And Jared, it was hardcore selling. He goes in there. And he starts telling me how my bad my market is. And, you know, they're really trying to, to, to improve. They're going to do their best with me and what they can offer. And he throws me this low ball offer. And, uh, and fortunately, I had been at sales for a while. I knew everything that was going down. But again, I was thoroughly enjoying the process. Because here I am as a young entrepreneur being trained from the brightest minds mm -hmm. in business. I mean, Comcast has always been on their game from the very beginning. Look at how they have acquired, I think they're the dominant media player in the industry today, right? So here's what I did. I strung it out as long as possible. I played hard to get I wanted more information. I needed to talk to this guy, to that guy. And I had a Harvard education of how to sell and close a deal. And uh, anyway, long story short is from, no, I'm not interested. Let's talk later. Talk to me next year. And I hung up. Wasn't rude. I was just not willing to discuss that with him. Eventually, six months later, we arrived at a price. And then I had a golden handcuff that I could not compete in that market for five years, which is pretty big. I don't even do that these days. Yeah. Um, but with that golden handcuff, they still had to pay me. So I didn't make as much money, but I got the chunk for the, for the license, which to this day I can't disclose, but I'll say it's seven figures. And I got a monthly revenue because they tied my hands from ever being in the, in, in the industry again. But to go through those contractual obligations, oh, I cannot tell you how much I learned. I bet. And yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. And here's the interesting thing I found. Most contracts are almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. There's little nuances, but the same contracts and operating agreements and LLCs that I put together today for apartment complexes and multifamilies, is almost exactly the same, except for a little less than 20% from the smartest brains in the room. And so you know what it told me? I can compete. I can compete in this field. It helped me not be intimidated because I went through that process. And that's why I think entrepreneurs, they need to just dig and not be intimidated. Go in bold and go in and learn whatever the craft is. Find the people that are doing what you want to do and decide that's my mark. I'm going to do what they're doing. I'm going to try and do it a notch better. And, and that's what I tried to do. And through that process, I just learned a bunch and eventually sold the company, um, which I regretted for a while. I wasn't the golf guy anymore. I had to go down in infamy as just Steve, but it's all right. You know, well, congratulations on, I mean, that's a very fun success story, you know, and yeah. I think at the end of the day, um, you were able to perhaps find something completely unique that at the end of the day was what ended up getting bought. And perhaps that's one of the great lessons that people can pull from this in their side hustle, their startup, their entrepreneurial journey. Uh, you're able to find something that was so unique that at the end, it didn't matter that it, it had to be bought because it couldn't be recreated. 
And, um, and uh, it, what a fun story. What a fascinating end to a fun ride you were on for quite a while. It was a long, it was a long journey. It, it, it was a fun journey. I mean, I enjoyed every bit of it. And, and it shows you too that side hustles, if they're really going to be successful, end up being full-time hustles, right? Something's got to get. Right. I mean, you can't do five side hustles. You, 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 eventually something goes dominant. It's always the 80-20 rule. 80% of your time should be devoted to what makes you the most amount of money. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, but yeah, no, it was a great ride. I learned a bunch. And uh, I developed great relationships with people, uh, and it, it, it was worth every every time, every minute of it. So you transitioned into real estate. We, we only have a few minutes left here, so um, you know. But I, I would like, I would love to hear how that's going, and 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 if you've kind of taken some of the similar uh, approaches to your to your real estate, your your construction endeavors, and then um, what your maybe some big takeaways from from your time there. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, a matter of fact, I'm going to start codifying everything I've been doing uh, and uh, eventually be promoting and, you know, do what everyone else does. We sell the 10 courses that do the X, Y, Z, but it's very usable information because I find there's a lot of people out there that would would want to take a step beyond just remodeling. You know, a lot of people are in the flipping business because that's what they've really promoted on TV. But you've noticed that not many people tell you how to build a brand new house. And not many people tell you how you can build a 30 unit complex. And the only difference between building one house and building 30 is just more problems. <laughs> if I build a house, I have to solve 100 problems. If I build an apartment complex, I have to solve 1,000 problems. But the problems are all the same thing right? It's all the same stuff. It's just more problems. Just 30 of them. <laughs> There's just, th- right. It's 30 and, times. Uh, <laughs> and, right. Yeah. So uh, uh, anyway, so that was just a great say. And uh, give me the original question, Jared. I lost track there. You have some fascinating takeaways from the golf site. And I'm oh, wondering yeah, what yeah. other fascinating takeaways you have from now your success in building homes. Yeah. Thank you. So, mm-hmm. so here's the thinking. If you go to anyone who got half their wits of them and can do things is entrepreneurial, let's say. And you said, you can build an apartment complex. They would look at you and go, I can't build an apartment complex. I'm not a builder. And I'd say, I'm not a builder either. I actually look at people and I tell them, this is the number one tool in my toolbox right here. (laughs) The connector again. It's a connector. It's all about connecting. So what I did was, is I had a friend Again, it's good to have friends. I had a friend that was a very successful builder and he wanted to build apartment complexes. And we are coming out of the crash of 2008 to 2012, right? So I built my golf business. I spun it off 2012. And I said, you know what? I got a deal for you. You got the know-how. I got the money. Why don't we start a business and we'll partner together and you'll teach me the trade and I'll be, I'll be the behind the scenes guy. I'll be the finance guy. I'll be um, the guy that helps runs the permits and figures all that out. You'll be the guy in the field. And then eventually, you know, we'll just kind of both do that. So he was excited about that because now he had a sugar dad. Yeah. And oh, he, he just got to do what he loved. And he still got to do what he loved. And so what happened is I was able to learn um, how to build and how to start from new. Uh, because here's the interesting thing, Jared. I spend more time, again, behind my computer, working through process to get a piece of land ready to build. Mm-hmm. And it's called entitlements. Mm-hmm. You get a piece of raw land, but it's not ready to build because you have to figure out where the sewers go, where the water goes. What are you going to do with all the water that's on the site? They want to drain that out. There's just all these list of problems that you have to solve. And the majority of that is done by talking to people, by hiring contractors that are engineers and civil type people, and by just processing and processing. So when I build an apartment project, it takes me three years. And two of those years are just behind the computer. Mm. It takes me a year to build, but two years to get it ready to build. So I learned from golf now 
that I could take a problem and deconstruct it and figure out what it takes to do it if I had one thing, a good mentor. And I'm telling you all my life, that's what it's been for me. It's been mentors. It's been people that I could cling on to or I could bring value to the relationship. And in return, they shared with me the skill level that they have. And I think that's where we're always at, right? If you think about your major markets in your life, major pivots, a lot of times it came down to a person mm -hmm. or a group of people that helped lead the way for you. And so I'm now in the building industry and I have taught several people how to take a house from, from foundation all the way up to live in that house. And then I've done apartment complexes and people give us money to invest with them because they don't have the time to do that, but they have the money, just like I did back in that day. And so now we build apartment complexes and we have a kind of particular mousetrap that we do. We do a particular type of product. We found through the years that our style of apartment complexes work the best. Everyone wants to buy them the best. Um, Matter of fact, my apartment complexes, if we go into a huge recession, I will be completely full because I build a particular product. It's not your high rise unit. My product is what we call garden style, three floors or less, no elevators if we can help it. It's almost like building a big house. It's the kind of apartments you saw around your college campus that all your friends lived in, right? And the difference is, is our units are brand new. So everyone always wants to live in a new unit. And, uh, and so when things get tough, the people that are in the expensive apartments come down and live in my apartments because they're <laughs> nice, right? Uh, but I have people there right now. And so it's just, uh, it, it's just as a, as a product that will always be needed. Again, it's something that people need. It's solving a huge problem. And the more I can solve that problem, the more apartment units I can build. Well, you've uh, you've been a uh, you've had a laundry list of of, of good one-liners and takeaways today. I think, if anything else, it's been a very inspirational hour in the life of of, of Steve and learning about. I mean, some of the things that the connect the connections that you create, the the way you look at solving problems. Um, the tenacity, I will say, that you bring to each problem that you're solving, and the go get them. Uh, roll your sleeves up, get dirty, and don't give up. Uh, expect it to be work. Embrace the work and love the work. I mean, so many good takeaways. You, you went from creating a um, an Amazon storefront to a golf booking platform to building apartments. I mean, what a uh, what a progression that is. Um, where can people get in touch with you or follow along with what you're doing if if they if they uh, if they want to? Yes, I'm working. Uh... I've been so bad at this and, and I know better because I've built so many websites and, and platforms. Um, um, I'm developing a brand new website that will be released in about two months and it's called findyourlife.com. So you want to find your life? So I'm going to talk about solutions to new business ideas. New, uh, you want to learn to build a house? It's going to be on there. Uh, you want to learn how to develop your real estate? It's going to be on there. If you're a brand new landlord, you want to learn how to property manage your own products, don't give it to another guy. You can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. There's just some simple rules and formulas you need to do. And again, I just learned it from someone else. And, and that's the biggest takeaway. You know what? I was never the golf guy. I was never the best golfer, but I became the golf guy because I helped the golf courses solve a problem, making more money. And with apartments, I realized that there was a big need there. And I was real fortunate that in my area, there was a need. Again, if there wasn't a need, then I couldn't sell the product, but I'd find something else. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I really grow up. And I think what it is, I'm just going to kind of teach people what I've learned and give them great ventings for opportunities and just kind of carry them along the way. Be a mentor to others as others were a mentor to me. Well, we'll uh, we'll be following along for that moment that you do grow up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whenever that does come, Steve. Thanks so much for coming today, and uh, congratulations on your success. It's really fun to hear the inner workings of a story behind what is now a, a large brand, and then all the other areas we touched on. Thanks for coming on board. Yeah. Hey, it was a pleasure, Jerry. Thanks for the time, and the best of luck to all your all your listeners.
Perfect. Have you been frustrated with your Google traffic lately? Are you tired of tools that make you search through millions of keywords and require a math degree to figure out? There's an SEO tool called Rank IQ that can help. They're ranked number one on G2 for both ease of use and customer satisfaction. Rank IQ gives you a list of the lowest competition, high traffic keywords in your niche, and they're all clear winners. When you choose one of their hand-picked keywords, their AI takes over and gives you a simple report telling you what Google wants you to cover in your blog post. Whether you have a new site or have been around for a while, Rank IQ will take your Google traffic to a whole new level. Go to rankiq.com slash niche pursuits to lock yourself in at 50% off their monthly rate. I'll put this special link in the episode's description. Hey, Jared here. Today's episode is sponsored by onelittleweb.com, a bespoke link building service provider trusted by hundreds of niche site business owners just like you. One Little Web manually handpicks real and relevant sites for guest post backlinks that receive at least 5,000 monthly organic visitors from Google. The best part is that you can check the quality of the sites and approve or ask for replacements until you get the desired domains for your guest posts. So we've arranged an exclusive welcome offer for Niche Pursuits listeners, where you will get a free DA40 backlink on your first order of a DA50 backlink. So again, you'll love One Little Web because A, they guarantee guest post backlinks with 5,000 plus monthly organic traffic sites. B, they let you review the sites beforehand and approve them. C, they write a 1,000 word, well-researched content post for every single guest post. So go to onelittleweb.com slash niche pursuits to claim your free DA40 backlink today. Again, that's O-N-E, L-I-T-T-L-E-W-E-B dot com slash niche pursuits.